later. And so this recording will be then posted to our social builder media and, and social media um, so that folks that couldn't come tonight can, can attend um, and watch those on our YouTube channel. So, um, all right, then I guess we'll get started. Um, so for those of you who don't know, my name is Allie Feldhausen. I'm the program manager at Social Builder. And um, this event is put on in partnership between Social Builder and Women.NYC. Um, for those that don't know about Social Builder, uh, Social Builder is a nonprofit that seeks to create a more inclusive tech environment for women through free webinars and trainings. Sorry, just admitting a few more folks as I talk. Um, this event is our final event in our webinar series, A Path Forward for Women in Tech. Um, and I, um, which was focusing on the multitude of ways in which nonprofits, companies, and governmental agencies are continuing to make more tech inclusive environments, uh, even during this difficult economic outlook and, and during COVID. Um, and I'm really happy about this event and this final panel because I think um, in a moment when we don't have control over a lot of different things, the ability to create our own destiny by growing our own businesses is, is really amazing. And I think the ways in which we can build equity and justice into those businesses is um, also really an important thing to be thinking about right now. Uh, just for the format for this particular event, it's going to be about a 30 minute panel discussion followed by a 15 minute Q&A. Um, and so if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and, and present yourself in the chat if you'd like. It's a, we have a, an, an intimate group tonight, so please feel free to share your name, your contact information if you want to connect. Um, and then the moderator will be checking the chat as we are talking, but um, we, you know, it, also if you have any pressing questions that you'd like to ask, keep those for the Q&A, um, which will be near the end. Um, and so on that, I wanna hand it over to Jasmine, who can speak more about our partner this evening, women.nyc, and the kinds of work that they're doing there. Thanks, Allie, and hi, everyone. Um, great to be with you all here. Um, I'm Jasmine Baker Taddeo, and I'm the Deputy Director for Women.NYC. And we are a New York City government initiative housed in the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And our mission is to support the women of New York City and their careers and businesses by providing real tools to help them succeed through innovative partnerships and programming. So a few examples of some stuff we do include free online salary negotiation workshops, downloadable guides to affordable tech training resources, and lastly, um, funding for female entrepreneurs and an entrepreneurial boot camp for women ages 50 plus, which are two um, programs we're offering in partnership with the New York City Department of Small Business Services. Um, and in 2021, we're really honing in on providing avenues for digital networking and career connections and working on surfacing innovative solutions to address the childcare crisis. So that's just a little bit about what we're doing. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. I will share my contact information with Allie, or you can visit woman.nyc's website, which is also our name conveniently. So that's just woman.nyc. You can follow us on social as well. But to keep it short, we're really excited to partner with Social Builder on this event. New York City has so many resources for budding entrepreneurs, and our panelists are the perfect people. You can either download on all of them. So with that, I'll kick it back to you, Allie. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, women, women.nyc does a ton of great stuff. So if you haven't checked out their website, please do. Um, and then on that note, I will pass it over to our lovely moderator, Michelle. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, well, thank you very much to our wonderful audience that joins us today in this event. My name is Michelle Mesa, and I'm a fellow at the New York City Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer and a recent graduate from Columbia University very much fascinated about the topic of tech for good. So I have to start by saying that we're very excited to have you here joining us today. And of course, a special thank you as well to our talented uh, women who conform this panel and with whom we will dis be discussing uh, things like how to start a tech center business, uh, the types of resources that the city has and other entities um, 
other entities are offering for this purpose and how tech center companies are as well promoting uh, greater equities through the work they're doing um, towards building a stronger and more just New York City for all. And especially as well, how the government is managing to promote this within the COVID era we're all living in. So with that, we will go right into our discussion and then open up for questions. I'll be tracking the chat. And um, so I'd like to start by maybe kindly asking our panelists to take a moment to introduce who you are, uh, what your organization or company does, and what is its ultimate mission, and a little bit maybe about your role and your uh, main responsibilities within it. Uh, sorry, there's, it's a lot to unpack, but I'll just open the floor here. Maybe we can start with um, Shanna. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to everyone for having me. I'm really excited to dig into this conversation with everyone. Um, I think it's a, it's a really timely topic and something we've been talking about um, in our office this year as well. Um, so my name is Shana Comey. I'm an innovation advisor at the New York City Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, which is where Michelle is, is um, also a fellow. Um, our office is the, the CTO's office, which means a lot of things and you know, a, a different thing in every city, I think. But for here, for New York City, it means that we are working to make technology accessible, inclusive, equitable, and make it work for all New Yorkers. Um, and that can mean you know, a very technical things like digital services, but it can also mean deciding um, on different recommendations around policies of technologies that affect New Yorkers, because as we know, um, Technology affects every you know aspect of your lives, and during COVID, especially, we've seen how services, government services, um, are directly impacted by technology as well. So that's like a very big, um, I think, focus for us as an office. Um, this work looks like access to broadband work, um, digital services for other agencies, like working with agencies to deliver services or find ways to make things more um, effective for New Yorkers for residents. Um, advising on technology policy strategy. Um, there's a variety of things that fall under the umbrella of the technology office. Um, so that's a little bit of a, of a, a taste of those. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a very brief overview of what we're trying to do. Thank you, Shanna. Um, Ashley, uh, could, would you, uh, could you share with us a little bit of you, your company, what do you do? and your key responsibilities within it. Yes, absolutely. Well, first, um, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me um, be a part of this discussion. Uh, my name is Ashley Wisdom. I am the co-founder and CEO of a digital health startup called Health in Her Hue. And Health in Her Hue is a digital health telehealth platform that connects Black women and women of color to culturally aligned and culturally sensitive health providers, um, content, and also telehealth services. And our mission is really to reduce the racial health disparities and to create a space where Black women, women of color, and our allies can share, learn, and innovate around the health issues that disproportionately affect um, Black women and women of color. But primarily, we're leveraging technology to try to reduce racial health disparities. Um, my background is actually in public health. So I actually used to work for New York City Health and Hospital before I got bit by the entrepreneurship bug. Um, and I'm based in New York City. So I've had the, the privilege of being able to tap into some of New York City's resources and some of the other re tech resources and communities that are based in New York. And so I'm really excited to dive into today's discussion. I'm very passionate about health equity and the intersection of healthcare, innovation, and technology. Thank you, Ashley. And um, actually, speaking about starting in this realm, and uh, maybe just uh, continuing with you, Ashley, um, what were maybe some of the challenges you encountered to start your own tech-led business? And maybe in your experience, uh, would you say there that you encounter any systemic barriers to enter the space? Um, and if so, uh, how did you overcome these challenges? Absolutely. So um, definitely encountered some challenges. So like I mentioned, my background is in public health. I've worked in healthcare, don't have any technical background. And so I always, I had this big vision for what would essentially be a technology platform, but I'm not a software engineer, I'm not a coder. So I did what most, you know, women founders do. You're just like scrappy and you, and you do what you, what you can do with what you have and started plugging myself into the tech ecosystem within New York. So I found out about 
um, Google Digital Coaches. Um, I went to New York City Small um, Business Services to get legal counsel. But there were definitely barriers in terms when it got to the point where I knew I needed to build out our technology platform. I couldn't find a software engineer. I didn't really know where I could go to get that level of expertise. And um, I, I actually met Ali at a panel that I was speaking at. And I used the opportunity to say, hey, I really need tech support. Like I have this idea, I have this vision, we're getting traction, but I can't build this platform and I don't have the resources to hire someone to build it for me. And so that was an obstacle that I, uh, that I came across, um, tapped into my network and was able to get connected to, Ali introduced me to Social Builder, to the Knowledge House. And one thing I'll add in is that when you're building a tech company, I think one of the systemic um, things is that the tech space can kind of feel like a social club. Um, it's, it's hard to get into unless you have the pedigree or have the social capital to get plugged in. And that in and of itself is a barrier. The other thing is as you're building a technology company and thinking of your team, you're also trying to think of how do I build a team that investors will actually invest in. And if they're looking for software engineers that come from Stanford, that come from Harvard Business School or Harvard, that's hard to, to find where you're just getting started. And I really wanted to build my platform with equity in mind. And so that means giving, other, giving women software engineers the opportunity to build with me. Um, and so I'll pause there, like finding women software engineers, not having the capital to be able to hire someone, but really needing that expertise and not knowing how to get plugged into the tech ecosystem, that those were some of the systemic barriers that I personally experienced and found a way to, to work around it given my, my network. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and Shana, I know we have you here as someone who is working in government, but I cannot hold myself to ask you about your uh, entrepreneurship background because I know you have also been in this other side. So I don't know if you would like to tap a little bit in the, in the same question. Uh, how was your experience? How did you um, how did you get immersed? If you if you had the also the experience of facing challenges and if so how do you overcome them and then uh we can we can move on into the government uh the more government related uh work yeah, yeah definitely um yeah I, for, I neglected to mention it um in my intro but yeah i was also an entrepreneur for a while um here in new york city between grad well during graduate school i started um Kind of co-founded a social enterprise with a classmate and then we stopped, um, continued working on that um, a little after graduate school and we were those kinds of people that start companies not because we were business majors <laughs> or because we were software engineers to to your point ashley but because we were subject matter experts and had like a very um you know a, a keen understanding of a particular issue and how you know a solution to solve it but we didn't come at it from um, from a wealth of knowledge of how to run a business and how to do all of those um, the, all of the intricacies of starting a company, um, especially not in New York City. So I, I I just feel a lot of what Ashley's describing in terms of the difficulties, the challenges to come overcome, um, and then also some of the resources that just frankly aren't there still. Um, I, I think that for me as an entrepreneur, there wasn't. Um, we, you know, we also had a hard time finding technical talent to to match to our, our solution. And that came up a lot in the entrepreneurship network in graduate school, that there were a lot of people with ideas and a lot of people with the skill set, but that matching didn't happen because of a variety of reasons. Um, so uh, kind of a, a lack, I don't know that it's necessarily a lack of, of the skills being there. I think it's just a lack of, um, you know, finding ways to meet to match those skills to each other and to um, find incentives and ways to make the startup experience a little bit more um, sustainable for people who are involved and who are jumping in. Um, and then I think another thing is, is, ironically, I think that we were just talking before everyone jumped on the call about how small the world is in New York City and in different sectors. So it's a very, very small, um, you know, entrepreneurship network and the social entrepreneurship and women in tech and, you know, all of these overlapping sort of communities are very small and yet they're very, um, disconnected sometimes. And so um, it comes down to things like this kind of event and this kind of series that Ali's putting on to bring people together and help you start to find folks. Um, you need different things at different times. So it's not always that you need a tech talent person. You're also going to need advice on how to, you know, 
construct a budget um, and how to, you know, advice on what kind of corporate structure you take and advice on how to build a board for yourself. And, you know, there's so many pieces to this that um, if you're an entrepreneur, it means you have a million hats, but you're constantly needing to be learning and constantly needing to be plugged into so many communities at once and so many skill sets and ecosystems. And so I think that's a really big challenge. I think there's a lot of space for us as a community, as a government, um, but also um, as as I guess community members to try to create those spaces for each other and to um, to build networks more. Thank you, Shana. And maybe in that same line, talking about challenges and now wearing your government hat, um, maybe uh, what kind of things uh, do you know? Do you do you see are being done maybe to support the creation and growth of companies that you know, are working to promote um, uh, spe specifically a more just and diverse uh, tech ecosystem? How, how, how do you see that now that you're uh, in the other side? Yeah. Um, so when I was an entrepreneur, I think I'm going to pull a statistic out of my head, but I believe the number was something like 2% of, of venture capital was going to female founded businesses. Um, That's still right, Shauna. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds um, that sounds about right. When you when you're the on, on the entrepreneur side of that statistic, like what are you supposed to do with that information? Because you've just been told that you have a 98 percent chance of not getting any funding. And um, I was a social entrepreneur. I think actually it depends on how you you know you classify your work, but you're doing a social tech work, and that's not on on the menu for traditional venture capital. And so I think that's something that's um, been a huge issue and has, I think, been um, a focus for some folks now in the last few years is diversifying um, venture capital on both sides. So what you're investing in, but also who's doing the investing and who's making those decisions. And, you know, like at the time there were, there was like a very short list of like, oh, you're a woman founder. Here's two, you know, firms that you should talk to, two funds. <laughs> and that was it. And this is the the capital of, of tech and, and um, entrepreneurship. And so there was clearly a big need and a clearly a huge amount of, um, of women and um, and just minorities creating businesses and you know incredible ideas that couldn't quite get to that next level. Um, it's very difficult as a startup to get to the stage where you're able to qualify for VC cap, uh, VC funding as well. And so getting folks from you know idea ideation stage to pre seed to seed or whatever it is right now, you know, getting up the, that ladder is very difficult because funding doesn't seem to kick in until a certain stage and. Um, you know, buy-in doesn't kick in until a certain maturity of your idea or your development. Tech is expensive to develop. And so it's a, it's a very um, tricky space. So I see that as like a big, um, it's always, it's just always the, the elephant in the room because you can't do anything without money, but you can't get money without doing something to, you know, so it's this chicken and egg, egg cycle. <laughs> um, I think I've been really excited to see some things coming into this space um, as a reaction to this. And I think last year, one of the um, the silver linings of the um, just focus and, and conversation around racial equity in New York City is that there's been more and more focus and funding on um, fun, um, on creating like funding opportunities for um, for women, for Black women, for other people of color, for all these different sort of segments of entrepreneurship and of tech. Um, and just the ecosystem we have here in New York City. So a couple of the, I have a whole bunch of things that I'd love to, to share. I've been talking to some of my um, colleagues about this and I have, I'd love to share some, you know, th links or something in an email later, but just to touch on a couple of things that I see going well in terms of pipelines and accelerators and resources being created. Um, one is called um, We NYC, which is Women Entrepreneurs in New York City. I'm sure you're familiar with it. They, I, I had a great call with, um, with some of their staff the other day and they, every day are adding more programs and more workshops and more um, resources to try to support women through this um, through COVID now at this point. So they already had a lot of workshops and one-on-one -on -one consultations. And I just learned that they're doing um, some specific one-on-one -on -one consultations around the PPE loans and trying to find ways to have community fund, um, I'm gonna blank on the name, but basically community funds qualify for PPE, PPP funding um, in a different way. And so there's some ways to access COVID-19 relief as a small business in New York. So they're trying to work with folks to find ways to make all these big, scary sorts of, um, of resources out there that we can't, you know, it, it feels very 
opaque, sometimes the website crashes, you know, there's, there's all these barriers, but it turns out that there are some things that they're trying to make um, work for specifically for women entrepreneurs in New York City. Um, another one is, is BNYC, which is Black Entrepreneurs in New York City. They're also like their, their biggest uh, focus right now is funding. Um, I didn't realize that New York City's population is 22% Black, but only has, or businesses are only 2% owned by Black or African American folks, 2% compared to 22%, which was kind of shocking to me um, from visiting businesses in New York City. I think that that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so that they're really focusing and trying to figure out, um, I think they just began this partnership about a year ago, I believe. Um, I think one of my colleagues is on the phone, so please jump in if I'm misstating. But um, they formed in reaction to sort of doing some research around this and starting to survey community members and, and figure out what some of those gaps were. And funding, of course, was the major one. So that's the thing that they're trying to focus on. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about in just a broad sort of stroke way is um, a focus on MWBEs in general. So as a city, we have this the certification process for um, companies. They do, I think it is only not uh, only for profit. But for companies with that structure that are led by a woman or a minority um, founder, owner, I think board member, something like that. And on paper, it is just a sort of certificate type thing. But the city, um, the way that we do contracting, the way that we look at um, applicants to our different sorts of challenges and competitions, um, the way that procurement works for different RFPs, that kind of thing. The MWB has become a, a bigger and bigger emphasis, I think, for the city as a way to, um, you know, one of many ways to look at a, a company from that perspective of, can we make this a more diverse, you know, um, pool? Can we can we bring in more diverse talent and, um, and just make it a little bit more inclusive of a, of a process. So I recommend looking into that. Even if you don't necessarily have that desi designation, it's something to look into um, as something that shows what the city at least is, is trying to focus on. Um, yeah, I think I've talked, I've rambled on a little bit, but I would love to share again, like links to all these different resources I'm learning about. And I look forward to this being a conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Shana. Yeah, I'm sure all the resources will be very valuable. So we'll be make sure to share them as well. Um, so I am sure that speaking about funding, I'm sure that this is one of the, this is in the, maybe at the top of the list of any entrepreneur tapping into what you were saying, Shana. And I would like to ask you, Ashley, what, kind, what kinds of resources um, have been key to growing your company? I'm sure, um, as I'm saying, um, that funding is a huge challenge, um, but I don't know if apart from from funding, uh, you have been able to to find other, you know, resources, maybe in kind, maybe mentorship, maybe workshops or other opportunities uh, that you can talk about um, that helped you start growing your company. And yes, and what kind of resources does the city provide maybe that you know to support the growth of innovative companies that uh, are utilizing tech as you're doing right now? Absolutely. Um, thank you for that question. So funding is definitely <laughs> like the number one thing that I think entrepreneurs, especially women of color entrepreneurs that we're in need of. Um, so right now my company is at a stage where we have amazing traction, but getting funding has been quite the experience as I am sure you can imagine. And we're starting to get investments now. Um, but what's been, what's been really frustrating is just knowing that if I, if I wasn't a black woman with the level of traction that I have now, I would definitely be much further along in my, my pre-seed fundraise. That said, um, it, to Shannon's point, it takes a lot you know, for companies to get to the point where investors are even interested in having a conversation. So for two years, while I was working my full-time job and being strategic, like I, I left my safe city job in your city health and hospitals to work for a startup consulting firm um, where I was working with strategic healthcare investors because I knew that I was gonna need the relationships to even get access to capital. And so it was very savvy as most of us are typically find ways to kind of like break into a space that isn't traditionally 
open um, to us. That said, um, I was able to leverage, like after work, I was going to Google digital coaches sessions and they were teaching you how to you leverage Google's different tools to kind of improve um, access and visibility to your company. But in that space, beyond just le learning how to use Google's tools, I was able to connect with other entrepreneurs and other um, people in the tech ecosystem. And I was able to pitch my company and practice talking about my company. So that was helpful. And in meeting other entrepreneurs in those spaces, you're then plugged into other resources that are available in the city. So I think just being around communities of um, founders and funders is like half the battle. Um, another organization that I got plugged into that, that was really helpful for me were, was called Black Women Talk Tech. And that's where I learned that I can build an MVP without code. And I was like, what? I can build a minimal viable product without having any software engineering expertise. Um, and if it wasn't for me plugging into that space and talking to other women, um, product managers and software engineers, I wouldn't have been privy to that. So um, uh, in addition to that, I've leveraged, like I think I mentioned at the top of the call, New York City um, Department, New York City's Department of Small Business Services. I had a, a person I was going to be working with as a co-founder initially, and we were trying to figure out how do we structure our agreements. We went in for legal, the legal clinic and were able to sit down and get free legal counsel. And that was very helpful to me because I just wanted to get a sense of what we needed, like how we needed to get our legal ducks in a row and didn't want to have to spend capital or money on just figuring out how to file an LLC and is an LLC structure um, the appropriate structure for me if I was ultimately going for venture capital? So the short answer to that question is no. Um, and I was able to get that answer from being in that space in, in New York City providing offices. So I, I think it's a mixture of of um, me just learning about this the ecosystem in New York City and plugging into that offer. But I still feel like like I'm, I'm taking notes of the resources that Shauna just mentioned and plan to tap into them after this call because I'm, as an entrepreneur, I'm still learning where I should plug into. Um, right before this call, I actually discovered, um, it's called, I'm looking at my notes really quickly. Um, Oh, what is it called? I thought I had it here. Oh, New York City Founder Guide. And basically, it's a list of all um, venture capital firms in New York City, at, and it breaks down what stages they're at. So do they fund pre-seed, seed stage, Series A, Series B? Um, do they have a focus on, you know, women-led businesses? And I was like I just like what I know about the future. So every tech or startup ecosystem is going to be extremely valuable to um, to people who have otherwise kind of been excluded from those spaces. Thank you, Ashley. And well, these, as we know, are nor not normal times. So I was wondering, uh, Shana, if looking it now from the government side and under the COVID times we're all in, are, if the government has put any specific maybe flagship programs that are meant to work as um, stepping stones uh, or direct pip pipelines or accelerators to promote uh, or propel more women in tech and other intersectionalities, uh, black women, Latino, LGBTQ um, community, um, that are, tend to be more uh, underrepresented in this in the ecosystem as you were referring to before and now with COVID even probably more? Yeah, it's, um, I think COVID's been such an interesting time from the city's perspective um, because it changed priorities very quickly and then those, those priorities have stayed changed. Um, in some cases, in, in, in good ways, because we're focusing on, on, um, on different issues, perhaps, that needed to be focused on. Um, and I think one of those is, is this, um, is funding other, funding under resource groups in general that aren't quite um, caught or included in the mainstream um, VC world or the mainstream entrepreneurship world. Um, I think specific programs, um, Let's see. So I was mentioning a minute ago some of the work that SBS, the Small Business Services, and We NYC, which is the Women Entrepreneurship um, Team, is doing. Um, they have a lot of different initiatives. A couple I wanted to, to, to mention specifically now that um, Ashley was mentioning some of the venture um, funds are um, 
called the We Fund programs under We, we NYC. So I'll talk a little bit about that and then talk about other, other types of programs if, if that works. So specific to their programs, um, they have one right now that's called We Fund Venture, which I guess the city just committed, um, I think in this last year, to $10 million in VC funding that's matched, um, matched by VC, so it matched, matches up to $30 million. And that is um, funding specifically within this Women Entrepreneurship Network. And so it's not funding that's set aside for um, the larger entrepreneurship field, but just specifically for women that are coming through um, their programs or, you know, through their, through their office. And um, they, they match you with a program manager from EDC that then helps you get through this process. So it's not just a, your traditional sort of, um, you know, prize money, you go, go forth and, and do, um, do what you can with it, but it's also someone that sort of walks you through the process and is able to kind of not only, um, I think, help, help hold your hand through some of the process as you need to of, you know, interfacing with, um, with the VC fund and with the funding, the procurement and everything. Um, but also just having somebody that's on the inside, you know, that can communicate and translate for you between different, um, different groups. So that's a really cool program. Um, another one is, um, for folks that don't have enough, um, let me see here, enough collateral to, to actually serve as their own guarantor or, you know, to back up their loans for different things with interest. Um, there's a program called We Fund Growth where the city can actually serve as a guarantor, which I thought was so fascinating because that's a, that's a huge component is underbanking or um, unbanked populations not being able to get to that initial, um, you know, that initial amount of credit to start. So that's an interesting project. Um, they're also working, like I mentioned a minute ago, that um, CDI, CDIFs, um, are kind of qualified differently underneath the PPP loans for COVID relief. So they're working with them to have small scale loans um, that work a little bit differently and it's specific for, um, for relief. But I asked them and it wasn't specific to COVID related businesses. So it doesn't have to be a, a health tech or a response type of project or a first response or something. It's just anyone that's affected, which is um, everyone. <laughs> and so it's an interesting kind of an, an open program. Um, and they have something called We Fund Crowd, which sounds like, like a it's zero percent and it's a crowdfunding program um, where the city will invest a little bit and it's up to ten thousand. So it's small amounts, but something that comes with zero interest. So if there's a way to kind of um, get connected with the network that way as well. Um, so those are some interesting things, and then they also have some um, legal consultations. I think in other um, other offices across the city, the the pandemic has kind of changed some of those projects that were meant to go out as like massive scale, um, you know, like regular sort of procurement projects or other kind of projects, um, because of the way that funding has moved around in the city, some folks are now um, focusing even more than they were on, um, on small scale challenges and accelerators and RFPs and sort of um, things that can be either lighter touch or smaller amounts or shorter term or just finding ways to still chip away at some of these issues. And a lot of us, again, really shifted priorities, I think, um, to focus even more on health care, on um, broadband access, on education, technology. Um, and so some of these issues people are honing in on now um, and trying to do programs. So our office, we um, just, just actually wrapped up um, two challenges, which were for entrepreneurs, for startups um, globally around mental health and housing. Um, so tenant harassment and then mental health for Latinx youth in Inwood in Washington Heights here in, in New York City. And we just wrapped those. We have four separate um, startups that won that challenge and they're going to be able to pilot with us, which is an awesome opportunity. It's not a lot of money. I think each one gets um, $20,000 through that program, but it's an, it's an opportunity to pilot with the city. So you're actually partnering directly with city agencies and working with their networks and working with our, you know, our CBO partners and, um, and getting to pilot something and also getting to really dig in um, on like a very niche level with a very specific issue and a very specific use case. So those are, there's programs like that. We also have a program called Moonshots. Um, I think there's some, some new Moonshots programs coming down um, the pipeline that are in the works that are a little bit more larger scale, just ask for you know, that this is a particular issue we have in the city and then start to call for applications and suggestions of what it could look like or what, you know, what a solution might be. And so some of those um, very open um, types of projects. And then there's also, um, I think various offices and I'll have to continue asking around and see what people are working on, but there are um, different sorts of RFPs and um, again, sort of calls for proposals where perhaps before there would have been funding in a team to do a project or it wasn't on the priority list or, you know, 
it, it's just been such an interesting shift to where now all of a sudden there are these opportunities, kind of these pockets of opportunity opening up for very specific types of work. So when, when COVID um, first hit in New York City, there was um, this scramble, as you probably remember, to find um, PPE, um, personal protective equipment, to find ventilator manufacturers, to find all of these um, response sort of, there, there was hardware involved, there was software involved, there were um, skill sets. And so there was this interesting shift where suddenly a lot of um, entrepreneurs you know, came together and we had this whole network of folks working with the city, with big um, manufacturing companies, um, with small, like little tiny companies with an idea and being able to see this sort of ecosystem of response happen was, was really interesting. So there's, there were also some, um, I think, opportunities opened up at that point. Um, and then I don't know enough about the Black Entrepreneurship Programming yet, uh, the BNYC programming, but that's something else that I'm really gonna try to keep an eye on because it sounds like they're trying to also focus again on funding, but then also um, it's very, very specific types of um, VC relationships I think that they're setting up. And then also um, I imagine setting up specific, um, uh, sector specific work as well. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a few of the things going on. <laughs> I'm always learning about more. This is the thing is that it's something that um, there's not a, you know, an office of entrepreneurship and there's not, you know, a, a specific person in the city that collects all this information. And so it's similar to the outside world. It's very much a network that we're starting to learn about what things are going on and then starting to connect each other to, to projects and to people. And so there's a lot going on. Um, and I think it's an exciting time. I think people are um, getting very creative. I think that um, times like these with when everything's a little bit uncertain and things change that at least it's um, it's really making all of us, I think, consider things from a new angle and really, really hone in on equity and inclusion as sort of the foundation approach rather than a an extra box to check at the end. Um, so I think there's some good stuff going on. Thank you, Shana. That was very um, comprehensive and I am sure it's going to be really, really helpful for the audience. Um, so we tend to normally speak about the present, but I think it would be very valuable as well to hear a little bit of the story behind you, uh, Ashley and Shana, your trajectory, because we tend to see the current picture of, okay, this, per this entrepreneur or this government um, professional are doing this kind of job of work, but certainly there is a whole path you both uh, built to get into this nexus of technology innovation business in the case of Ashley and uh, Shana with, with what you're doing right now, the mayor's office in technology innovation and maybe more public policy. So I would like to hear a little bit now, uh, maybe uh, for our, our audience, how did you get to where you are now? If somebody now wants to become an entrepreneur or wants to get, dig into the nexus of public policy, tech, inclusive innovation, where to start, who to, what, what doors to knock, who to call? Um, can you tell us a little bit of your, of your uh, trajectory, your experience? Sure, happy to dive in there. So um, my background, so I started off my career working for a federally qualified center, a community health center. And that really opened my eyes to the inequities in the healthcare system. And I like, I'm very much passionate about social justice and equity. And so I decided the healthcare industry is where I wanted to affect change. So I got my master's in public health at NYU, worked for um, an academic medical center after um, moving on from the community health center and working in one of the premier health institutions in New York City, um, my experience seeing how insidious institutional racism um, is in those spaces, as well as learning about the many social factors that ultimately um, impact health outcomes for women of color and black women specifically, really just burdened me. Like I was reading papers for class and crying and I figured if I'm this burdened by this problem, I should probably do something to try to move the needle in some way. And I saw all this innovation happening in healthcare and didn't see any solutions that were really being built that addressed the very nuanced and specific 
needs that women of color have as they're navigating the healthcare system. So I figured, you know, I'm going to apply my public health and health policy lens to innovation because I see a lot of folks building stuff, but they don't really know intimately the industries that they're building solutions for. And I know this problem intimately being a black woman and having worked in healthcare my entire career. Um, so I started building Health and Review with what I could do. I could buy a URL, came up with a mission and vision statement and leverage my network in healthcare and figured I'm gonna start with building community. And once I have an engaged community around the content and information that I'm helping to share, taking health information out of the ivory tower and making it more culturally relevant and accessible to black women, I'll be able to, I think I'll be able to build a product from there. And so that was my plan. For two years I spent, um, for two years I worked on developing content and providing value to women in that way. And then June of this year, built the MVP of our uh, platform. Again, I said I was plugging into different um, startup spaces, um, learning about no code solutions that you don't wanna spend money building out technology until you validated that there's really a market demand for it. And so I, because I was bootstrapping, I had to be very you know, judicious with my finances and was scrappy and, and built an MVP that validated that there's a demand for the product that ultimately wanna build. So the, I'll, actually, I'm jumping around with my career a, a little bit, but to get to the juicy part, once I realized that like I was onto something, I needed to also understand what it's like to work for a startup. So I left um, my job at New York City Health and Hospitals to work for a startup consulting firm. And it was strategic, like I mentioned before, I wanted to one, learn what it was like to work for a startup. So I was the only employee for this firm. And I was working with 14 different strategic healthcare um, investors who were investors in different health systems around the country. And I got to understand how they think about health technology, how they do due diligence on them. And I did this all very intentionally because I was building my own health tech company and wanted to understand how do strategic healthcare investors, where do they find the value and how can I build health and Hue to have a strong value proposition. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the story. I think I've been really good at making strategic moves that allowed me to sneak my way into the space and build the relationships that I needed to get to where I am now. I still have a hell of a way to go, but um, I think that just being intentional about finding those spaces that would give me access to the resources that I needed to get to each stage um, has been very um, helpful to me as, as an entrepreneur. And I'm, even on this conversation, as much as I'm sharing, I'm learning a lot and I'm really excited to, to learn more about the resources and actually check them out. Thank you, Ashley. And Shana, do you want to share a little bit about your trajectory? How did you get to the to the mayor's office and how do you get to get into this specific, I don't know if it's a niche uh, anymore, but into this specific sector of technology, innovation and public policy or tech for good? Yeah, yeah, it changes names every year. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a good question. I think when you're in the moment and looking forward, it's so unclear the the patterns, but then looking back, there are sort of those threads um, over time. I think for me, it's been about human-centered design um, and then roughly civic tech or civic innovation throughout my career. But I actually started in humanitarian policy and I was, um, and then I was in community development. I was constantly going back and forth between like grassroots level as a Peace Corps volunteer um, in Colombia and you know like that that in day in and day out sort of um, level of community development work and then back to like a government level of looking at things from you know the millions of people affected by something and the billions of um, of funds that go into different sorts of policies so I was working in refugee policy um, and then I got to grad school at, um, at Columbia at SIPA and I initially came in working more specifically on human rights and refugee policy again. And our startup was actually um, a refugee workforce development project that um, after I had worked in a refugee camp in Greece, we looked at how education doesn't transfer between um, you know, school system to school system and language to language and how education, no matter what you know, place you go to and from, education gets lost consistently along the way. And that's happening right now in New York with folks that are, um, that are offline and aren't able to participate in school um, at the same level as their classmates. So the sort of um, access to education um, issues. But, but in the process of starting the, the startup, we 
um, we started to focus at, we were, in, we were still students at um, XIPA and started to focus on all of the courses around social entrepreneurship, around civic innovation, around um, technology and government. And I started to see that that really this human-centered design is this foundation throughout, um, throughout everything where it's all about making sure that whatever you're doing is applicable and is responsive and is asking the questions of the end user, like the, the, the person who's directly affected by the government policy that's being passed or by the, um, you know, the, the curriculum that's being written or um, in, in this conversation, the, the healthcare, you know, resources that are being made available and how they're being made available. And so being a little bit more responsive to that, um, to the end user. And um, so that, that was really, interesting to me. So I started to take more and more um, courses in that area and started looking more into civic innovation um, as it is. And that led me into my work here in, in innovation. And so I'm on the inclusive innovation team, which in, um, in the CTO's office means that we do a lot of human centered design, like via community engagement work um, with the community, doing sorts of projects where we, you know, kind of try to understand a particular issue that the community raises and figure out ways that you could um, you know, what kinds of resources could you bring in for that or what kinds of um, solutions are out there that could maybe meet a specific need. Um, and it also goes to an in internal intergovernmental, um, intergovernmental rather, um, level where we're working with other agencies and saying what kinds of, you know, needs are there, the end user that's developing a service for residents or this website you're trying to, you know, help folks apply for, for a particular service or, you know, whatever these different issues that you're dealing with as a government worker, how can we also approach that from a human-centered perspective or a user-centric perspective. Um, and so I think there's a lot of um, a lot of space for us in government and the you know, multilateral sort of level of work to, to not lose sight of who the end user is and how these things are um, affecting that end user, but also what the priorities are. Because, I mean, startup number one, startup 101 rather, is if the user, if the customer doesn't want your product, it's over. <laughs> You know, and so if your customer is not excited about it because you didn't actually figure out what they would respond to or what they were really asking for or really trying to communicate to you, then you're kind of a, you know, it's a non-starter. And so I think that, that those are principles that we can bring into, um, into government. And I've been having a lot of fun um, trying to trying to continue to have that perspective. Um, and at the same time, as the tech office, we get to marry tech sector sort of principles with government. And so bring in some of that mentality, but also bring in a mentality of let's try things, let's not maybe perhaps break things, but let's test things out and, you know, think outside the box a little bit and um, perhaps narrow our scope enough that we can test something and then make something that's um, much more useful, much more sustainable, um, much better for our residents in the long, in the long run. So that's kind of my meandering, um, I guess, thesis statement of, of what I'm working on. So I think that everything ultimately becomes a human-centered design problem. Thank you, Shanna, and thank you, Ashley. We have many more questions here, but we are running out of time. So we are approaching to our last part of the of this interesting discussion. Um, and I, with that, I think we can open it to our Q&A, if that's okay, Ali? Yeah? Okay, perfect. So uh, please feel free to share your questions uh, in the chat, and I'll be happy to raise um, raise them as they come, or otherwise I'll continue raising some questions that we have here, but I am sure the audience has questions here. Um, let me see. And also in the chat, there are many interesting resources that um, Shana, Ashley, Jasmine, Jasmine have been sharing, so please feel free to just step into those. Let me see. There we go. So, um, okay, so this question is from Ray Harris. I see Pa Alum also. Sorry, I'm, I'm switching here with Spanish. But okay, so Ray is asking, who was your biggest insp inspiration for your career? And maybe I'll just connect that question with one uh, and I think fits, fits that same line well, which is if you had um, maybe one piece of advice for someone interested in starting a business right now, what would it be? 
maybe uh, we can cover those two questions as we wait for uh, some more in these last minutes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Shana, would you like to start or Ashley? Whomever, please feel free. I'm trying to think of um, who has inspired me in, in the tech space and I, I can't think quick on my toes right now. I want to make sure I give a good answer, but I will say that there's there's this. I'm a fan of Toni Morrison, the writer. She I went to Howard University for undergrad, and Toni Morrison is one of my favorite writers. And a quote of hers that really just motivates me and the work that I do is um, she said that I get angry about things, then I go on and work, and that has been something that has um, been the driving force of the work that I do. Like I became very angry about this problem of health inequities, health disparities, um, specifically those plaguing black women. And that is what was the impetus for me doing the work that I do. And it's what keeps me waking up every morning, even though I feel insane for not going and getting my next good, well-paying gig. Um, but I'm just so committed to this work because of how angry I am about the inequities. And I just feel like this is the work that I'm, that I'm committed to. So she has been one of she's been one of my biggest inspirations professionally and also that quote from her is really what drives the work that i do um in, in terms of tips one of the things that i always tell other entrepreneurs or people who are interested in starting a business is figure out what's that problem that pain point that really plagues you um that thing that keeps you up at night um that social ill that you're just frustrated about every time you see a headline in the news or come across your twitter feed because that might be the thing that you're supposed to work on. So that's my one piece of advice. And then talk to other founders to get connections to, to capital. Because at the end of the day, money really rules things. You can have all the passion, but if you don't have the capital to work on the thing that you know we work on, it's kind of a no starter. So those are my, there. That was very inspiring. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Shana. Yeah, these are really difficult questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess on the tip side first, um, I was thinking about this and, and realizing how much of a marathon it must be right now to be um, an entrepreneur. And I think that, you know, even, even in like normal times, so to speak, it was all about the hustle, the hustle, hustle. But I think that um, it just finding ways to manage burnout um, has to be more important now than ever. Um, as an entrepreneur, as anyone really, um, and any, you know, this is a really difficult time, I think, for, for everyone. And so I think um, managing your burnout and being very cognizant of the fact that you're, you are very different. You're not the same um, as whatever statistic or whatever story. I think there's so many rules in the startup world where everyone, you know, there's all these statistics where like, it's just accepted as a fact that this is the way it is. And so, you know, if you're going to start a company, you have to do this first and you have to do it this way and you have to do it with these people. And I think those rules um, really got in the way for me as in my entrepreneurship experience. Um, and I think that they, for better or worse, I think as, as someone who's not like perhaps the, tr the traditional idea of what a startup um, bro is, I think that you have to find ways to, to, to create your own community, create your own rules, create your own order of operations, um, and, and then manage the burnout because I think the burnout, it's, it's, um, it's so isolating as an entrepreneur. And I think that that's something that's gotta be, we're all a little more isolated this year, um, through, through, um, COVID as well. And so making sure to recognize the symptoms in yourself and figure out what your own personal limits are and what your needs are and what you need to be okay and to be on on your best game because um like Ashley's saying like it's it's this it's this passion but it's this it's this entire um you need your best game you need your best self um forward but you can't get there if you're struggling yourself so just managing burnout being cognizant of that create those communities um and then I think in terms of inspiration um that's a really hard question I think I, I took some really great classes at P at, at um SIPA at Columbia from um, various people who, who were practitioners themselves in civic tech. So folks that were working um, at New America, that were working, had worked at the White House previously, um, had been in um, like strategic consulting. And so they brought directly to the classroom um, this, this idea of working with government as something that's exciting, where there's so much change happening in government and there's so much potential for impact. Um, 
and and that kind of excitement was very infectious to me. So following those kinds of folks, I, I guess just finding your your little corner of Twitter where those kinds of folks are, are hanging out. I've got my civic innovation corner and those people are killing it. So um, finding inspiration from people that are doing things that are perhaps a little bit outside of the um, the traditional route or the traditional um, approach is a really good idea, I think. Thank you, Shana. Thank you, Ashley. Well, I think some words that are sticking here in my mind are that this is a marathon, that it is gla glass breaking probably, that you have to start from scratch in all sorts of ways from building your community to finding your little corner on Twitter to um, just finding your topic. And I think also Ashley said something was um, true that is find that thing that makes you angry but channel that anger into positive action through tech. So through tech, through entrepreneurship. And with that, I think I, we're running out of time. So I'll pass it over to you, Ali. And thank you so much, Shana and Ashley, for this very, very interesting and inspiring um, insights. Yes, no, thank you guys so, so much. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for being our lovely moderator this evening. Um, I'm always so appreciative of everyone that just that comes and shares um, their perspective. Oh, I think does someone have a? Um, but I just yeah, I wanted to let everyone know in case you were wildly trying to take notes and were worried. Um, I will put all of this in a document and send this to to everyone afterwards. Um, so so don't worry about that. And I also want to do a quick shout out that Health and Her Hue, um, their app is out. Um, so check it out, but it also there's going to be a new a new version um, at the end of this month. Um, so if you want to want to wait, you can do that too. Um, but yeah, I've been following Ashley's work this whole year, and I'm just it's it's really great to see, um, especially like during this moment, to see all the all the amazing growth that you've had. Um, so thank you all again for coming tonight. Um, please feel free to be in touch if you have further questions or you just want to connect and talk about all these topics. It's been a really great journey to do this whole series with everyone and um, hope everyone has, you know, a lovely, a lovely rest of your evening and, and does something nice and just has some time for yourself. So thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Bye. Thank you. Take Thank care. you, Ali. Bye.